Hi, guys. This is God Saad for The Sad Truth. Today, I have a guest who's been kind enough to invite me several times on his show. And as we know from Middle Eastern hospitality, it's a grave violation to not reciprocate. And he is a very interesting guy. Zubi, how are you doing, sir? I am doing great, Gad. How are you? Very good. Very good. Uh, I hear that you were feeling uh, a bit sick. I think it's going around everywhere around the world. Uh, you told me that you're feeling better. Things are looking up. Yeah, feeling a lot better now. Um, it happens. My uh, sister and my nephews were sick um, a couple of weeks ago, and I actually went to visit them in hospital because my my little baby nephew had to go to, into hospital for a couple of days. So um, I think I most likely got it off them. Um, after that, I went to I had an event in Johannesburg, and then as soon as I came back from Johannesburg, I got sick. So I think my body realized that that was when I was allowed to. So I took a couple of days out, but I'm back on it now. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear it. I uh, have been suffering from a very nasty cough. So again, apologies to all the listeners and viewers. If you if I cough in your ear, it's been about three weeks. And I also had some stomach issues. You know, if I hope one day you have children, you'll realize that from the age of about when they first go into kindergarten till they get out of elementary, prepare to be perpetually sick because they're, they're <laughs> just virus machines. And so once they got older... I actually noticed that I was much uh, healthier because I wasn't catching all the bugs that they were bringing home. I'm assuming that it is still within your uh, big plan to have children. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm an uncle times 10. So I have five nieces and I have five nephews. So um, I'm not a father yet, but I have certainly seen, I've seen all four of my siblings go through the process and they're all going through the process right now. I'm very close to all my nieces and nephews. So even though I don't have my own children thus far, um, I absolutely plan to in the future. And I've got a lot of wonderful children in my family. Well, uh, yesterday, you I'm not sure if you saw it on uh, social media, I announced that my wife and I were celebrating our 24th anniversary uh, from 1999. And I discuss it in in, in this in this baby and the sad truth about happiness i discussed that one of the most important decisions is choosing the right spouse have you made that correct decision so far is there is zuby taken are you going to break every all the women's hearts or what what's going on yeah i am uh i am taken as of about almost seven months ago so uh that is all going well um and yeah i i i'm happy Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, you mentioned just a few minutes ago, uh, Johannesburg. I'd I love to hear more about that. Now, I've always had a, a desire to visit Cape Town. I've never been to South Africa, but uh, Cape Town looks like a mix of Lebanon because of its kind of temperate Mediterranean-like temperature. Also looks like Southern California, where I lived for, for a few years. Uh, did you get a chance to go to Cape Town? first answer that and then how was Johannesburg was this your first time in South Africa yeah sure thing so actually it was my second time in South Africa I went over there in March I have a friend who lives in Joburg and he got uh, married over there in March and since it was my first time in the country I decided to stay an additional 12 days so I spent time in both Johannesburg and I spent 10 days in Cape Town as well so I was in Cape Town back in March I even uh took the opportunity to climb up Table Mountain. Wow. I did a meet up there with some of my followers and supporters. I met a lot of great people. I connected with some people who I'd done podcasts with over the years, but hadn't met before in person. Um, and then when I was just in Johannesburg a couple of weeks ago, I, I was that one was just a, a two day trip. So I just went there to speak at an event called uh, Psycho Finance Leaders. So it was a, a financial conference that they had going on and they, they invited me to um, do a, a couple of panels but this time I actually got to see more of Johannesburg. So last time I saw more of Cape Town. This time I got to see a little bit more of Johannesburg. Um, so yeah, they're they're pretty different cities. Cape Town is definitely more, it's more beautiful and more touristy. It's it's more of a place that people would sort of visit and spend time. Johannesburg is more of a big city, hustle and bustle, much more urban. It's a very green city, actually, very green, but um, not as much natural beauty. You don't have the mountains and the seaside. Now, we, we, of course, we always hear, oh, how dangerous it is and so on. Oftentimes, those, uh, you know, uh, perceptions are, you know, overblown. Did you feel safe? Did, it, did you feel that there was an ominous threat looming over behind every corner? How, how was it like? 
Yeah, no, I, I didn't feel that. But at the same time, I'm very aware that are, there are particular areas of both of those cities. So in Cape Town, for example, there's an area called Cape Flats, which is very notorious. It actually has one of the highest crime rates, I think, of any neighborhood, perhaps in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Johannesburg, you know, they have still got many of the, what do they call them, the townships. Yeah, and right. some of those areas are much more dangerous. I've heard downtown Johannesburg itself is actually pretty dangerous if you, particularly if you go there at nighttime, um, many of the apartment blocks are essentially run by gangs. They kind of just take over entire apartment blocks and then run their operations out of there. So I think the the potential danger is real, but at the same time, you can avoid it just by being wise and not wandering by yourself into dodgy looking areas at night if you see what i mean yeah no i got you uh just yeah. one last point on on uh, south africa then i want to move to namibia in a second you'll see in a sec mm. uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm making that switch uh and i think it was 1987 so i was a very young guy at that point w were you even born zuby in 87 uh, i would have been one. Oh my god i'm old uh but anyways <laughs> uh I had gone to see the movie Cry Freedom. Do you, are you familiar with that movie? Do you know what that's about? Um, <laughs> no, I, I haven't seen that one. Oh, I, I highly recommend it both to you and to all our viewers and listeners. It's a movie that recounts the story of the anti-apartheid uh, activist, mm -hmm. Steve Biko. Uh, and as I say it, I, I'm getting goosebumps because, uh, you know, whenever someone asks me, you know, what are some folks who you know, uh, inspired you and so on. And and he, so Steve Biko was this, you know, a, a, as the term that I use was a real old school honey badger. I mean, he's, he's speaking out in a, in an environment where it's going to go badly for you if you speak out. And then he wrote a book called, I write what I like, meaning you're not going to constrain me. You're not going to stop me. I'm going to speak my mind. Of course, eventually he was tortured and killed. Uh, but what, what, what moved me so much when I was a young guy is I, it resonated with me th th this is the kind of hero that we need. And, uh, so anyway, so if you haven't read it, if you haven't read that book, it's a short book. I write what I like and see the movie cry freedom. I'm, I haven't seen it around, you know, often these movies play, you can catch them. It's kind of disappeared, but I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Now, Namibia, have you been to Namibia, Zubi? Not yet. Uh, not yet, meaning that you you it's on your radar. Yeah, I, I plan to visit at least a hundred different countries. Um, I think I'm on 43 right now, 43 or 44, but I'd like to get to a hundred within my lifetime. <laughs> well, I mean, what I guess hundred is just a nice round number, but what why a hundred? Why not uh what what made that uh, uh, I don't know. It's it's a nice number, it's three <laughs> figures. Um it, it, it <laughs> and I guess I'm I'm approaching the halfway mark. Yes. Um, of it. So I think, yeah, I, I, I just think it's a, it's a good number. I think at that point I could say I've seen about half the countries in the world. Yeah, that, that is true. It's about, I think it's around two, 203 that are in the United Nations or something around that. Uh, the reason why Namibia fascinates me is, uh, well, first, uh, from everything that I've seen, the, the topography, the landscape is otherworldly, right? You've got these dunes that then break straight into the, this ominous looking ocean. So it's a very raw, as I said, otherworldly uh, topography. But the other reason why I love Namibia is because uh, yeah, I'm a huge animal lover. And yes, you can love animals and still eat salmon uh, because uh, you know I'll get I'll get the tofu brigade who'll come after me and say you're such a hypocrite, right? You keep talking about loving animals and yet you you haven't gone vegan. So, anyways, uh, there's this very rare hyena called the brown hyena or long haired hyena that is in the desert of Namibia. And it currently has taken over this old uh, abandoned ghost town, mining town called Elizabeth Bay. And these hyenas are known as the ghosts of the desert because they just kind of materialize out of thin air, almost like these, well, not almost, they they, they look like mythical creatures. And so it's always been my fantasy to, to go and actually... Uh, see these beautiful mythical creatures. Now, I have a sabbatical coming up, and so I'm trying to find a way to fit a trip into Namibia within some professional 
you know, context. And so I've reached out to a few uh, universities in uh, Namibia to see if we can make something happen. So if I get there before you, I'll report back and let you know how it goes. Yeah, that would be awesome, man. I, I'm such a, I love seeing the world. I think one of the bless, biggest blessings that I've had in my life is being able to travel from a very young age. Um, and then I think that sort of just <laughs> put inside of me some type of wanderlust and curiosity about the world. I love maps. I love globes. Anytime I see a map or I see a globe, I just, I'm just staring at it and looking at places that I've been to, places I want to go to, places that spark my curiosity. There's many countries I've been to simply because I didn't know a lot of people who had been to them. So I just wanted to go there and see see what it was like. So I've been to the many places that have a lot of tourism, but I've also been to uh, a few countries that are not sort of major tourist destinations, just out of curiosity. Um, but yeah, I just think in this lifetime, having that opportunity to learn more about people, just there's just so much to see. There's so much to see that um, I, I understand that not everyone has the opportunity to travel, but I think that for those who do have the opportunity and have the means, I sometimes struggle to understand how someone can totally be content to just spend their entire life for decades and decades and decades just only seeing a very, very small part of it when there's just so much out there. And to be honest, it's never been so easy and frankly inexpensive to at least, you know, you, you don't have to go to every single country in the world, but at least to, to check out a couple others. Well, that that fits very nicely. In, in one of the chapters of my latest book, I talk about the importance of variety seeking. And I talk about variety seeking, food variety seeking. Now, sexual variety seeking is fraught with some problems because if we're in a monogamous union, we may not want to violate that. But we also have a penchant for sexual variety seeking. I talk about intellectual variety seeking, which is something that uh, you know, academics try to pretend that they're for, but then they end up being hyper specialists who focus in a very, very narrow area. Whereas I argue that life is too short to not seek, you know, intellectual landscapes, country landscapes. So to your point, and so I, I think that's, you know, that's that's a fundamental recipe of happiness at the end of your life when you look back and you say, hey, I've been to a hundred countries. That's what wealth is. I mean, people think of wealth as, you know, uh, you know, Elon Musk is the the, the most, uh, you know, wealthy man who's ever lived. But let's suppose that he had never traveled. Well, then one could argue that Zuby, who's been to 100 countries, might be a wealthier guy in terms of the accumulated adventures and experiences. So I think that's wonderful. But so coming back to your trajectory, you said you 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 grew up in several places. So maybe you could tell us about that. And then maybe segue into how you've been able to build this incredible platform when you know one could argue it it's very difficult to build right you're not you're not you're not a journalist you're not a you know a, a professor you're not whatever you know you're not Joe Rogan somehow and yet you've been able to be incredibly successful in building a platform that people listen to you're a motivational speaker tell us the whole trajectory of Zuby absolutely um okay so let's take it way back to the beginning so as alluded to earlier, um, I was born in 1986. I am the last of five children. My parents are both originally from Nigeria. They're Igbo, so I'm from an Igbo family. So I was born in the UK. And when I was a baby, my dad got a job offer to work in Saudi Arabia. So all my earliest memories begin in Saudi Arabia. So as I understand it, he got a job offer. He came back home and he told his wife, aka my mother and his five children, hey, we're moving to Saudi Arabia. And so <laughs> and so they went on, you know, on faith and on trust. And they went out there in the mid to late 80s and ended up staying there for about 20 years. My dad is a medical doctor. My mom was working as a journalist at the time, a real journalist, not the type that we have, uh, <laughs> the activist type that we have today. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was in Saudi Arabia from a very young age. I went to preschool there. I went to kindergarten up until fifth grade. I was there. Um, I grew up in a, a small expat community, place maybe about 1,200. I think there were about 1,200 people, 1,200 to 1,400. 1,200 to 1,400 people from all over the world. Um, 
all the different Arab countries, European countries, Australia, Canada, USA, UK, just all over the place. Um, so I was in a truly diverse environment, people of different backgrounds, nationalities, um, faiths, beliefs, everything. And it was a very, it was a very safe, cordial, harmonious society. Um, when I was 11 years old, I went to boarding school. So I finished fifth grade in Saudi. I went to boarding school at the age of 11 in the UK. So from the ages of 11 to 20, so for seven years of secondary school and then three years of university, I was back and forth between the two countries. I still lived in Saudi, but during the term time, I was in the UK. So I'd be going back and forth. So was that, that also meant that I was... Sorry, was that difficult in that, you know, you're not surrounded by your parents? Do you miss them? Or is it, thank God, I'm free. I can I can be, you know, free of the shackles of parental oversight. Um, Honestly, it was neither. It wasn't difficult. I enjoyed it. I, I saw it as an adventure, even from a very young age. And perhaps for me, it was a bit normalized because I'm the youngest of five children. And all of my older siblings also went to boarding school. So... I know for some people, boarding school, especially going overseas for it, is a very sort of weird and foreign concept to them. But for me and my family and the people I was around, it was very normal. So many of my friends went to boarding school, their siblings went to boarding school and so on. So I did um, I did well in school. I got into Oxford University and I went there when I was 18 years old and I studied computer science. I did that, I got my degree, I graduated when I was 20. And when I was in um, Oxford, that was a pivotal time for me. So I started rapping when I was in my first year of university. Um, I'd been a hip hop fan since my early teen years. And I was just listening to all of these different artists throughout my teenage years. And then I just started, I, I just started as a hobby. I just, I just wrote down a couple of verses when I was traveling and I kept doing it. I came back to, um, when I was in my first year of university, one of my friends named Chris had a basic recording studio in his dorm room. So I would download beats off of the internet and then I write something down and I would just record some simple, some simple tracks. And then I'd email them to people, you know, just share them with my friends and family and people in my college. And I started to build up a little bit of a buzz, right? People started saying, oh, you know, like the, you've got some cool songs going on here. Um, after I'd been rapping for about 10 months, I released my first album. So this was in my second year of university, 2006. I put out my very first album called Commercial Underground. It was just um, a seven, eight, eight track, an eight track album. Um, I uh, just, I remember the, I remember this is back in the age of CDs, right? This is when everyone was buying CDs. So I actually explicitly remembered making 50 copies and I sold those 50 copies in about a week. So I think that was a very important moment because that was the light bulb moment where I realized this is something I can do as more than just a hobby, right? When I was making those physical exchanges of, I give someone a CD, they give me a five pound note. And then I was doing, um, I started to do some gigs locally. I actually did a couple of gigs in my hometown in Saudi Arabia. I did some gigs when I was back in Oxford and I got invited to do some performances in London and a few other, a few other places. And by the time I graduated at the age of 20, I had actually sold, I think I'd sold about 2000 copies of my first album hand to hand by the time that I had graduated. Wow. So, so, so after that, I took one year out. Um, I did my music full time for one year. I released a second album called The Unknown Celebrity. This is going back to 2008. So I put out a second album and I, I started, I started going out on the street and just talking to people and promoting my music, playing them my stuff and selling my CDs. Fast forward over the course of time. Um, okay, actually, let, let me let me do this in, in the proper order. Um, after taking a year out, after graduating and doing my music full time for one year, um, I already had a job lined up before I had graduated, but I, I deferred it for one year. So I moved to London. I worked as a management consultant for three years. So from 2008 to 2011, I had a full-time job. I had a corporate job, suit and tie. I was a management consultant working for lots of uh, big, well-known companies in different sectors. And then in early 2011, I made a decision, but that by the end of that year, I wanted to go full-time with my music. So I made a commitment in January, 2011. I remember writing it down that by the end of that year, 
I was going to quit my job and I was going to be a full-time rapper. And I did it. I set up my company, COM Entertainment Limited. I set that up back in August, 2011. Um, I incorporated that with the company's house in the UK and did all the paperwork. And then in September, 2011, I resigned. I I handed in my notice at my job and Can I stop you there for a second? People, please uh, do. Please do. Yeah, uh I'm trying to imagine the professional Nigerian parents with the medical doctor father saying next time I see you I'm going to beat you senseless because you're an Oxford grad in computer science, you've been a management consultant, you're going to do this nonsense wrapping stuff. Did I, did I roughly cover that properly? That's what you would have expected, but it was the opposite. Oh, my goodness. What great parents. Yes. I need to meet them. Yeah, props to my parents. Um, they have been incredibly supportive of me in, honestly, in all of my endeavors. I think there's a couple things that also help with this. I think the fact that I didn't drop out of university to right. pursue a music career, right? I'd already got my degree at this point. I already had um I already had some years working experience under my belt. And perhaps most importantly, by this stage I'd already put out three independent releases and I'd actually sold a few thousand albums already. Um I was already making money from my music, not enough for a full-time income, but I was making, you know, maybe at the time when I quit my job, I was making maybe making about a thousand pounds a month from my music. So I thought, okay, if I give this my all, I'm sure that I can at least I can at least double that. And if I can double that, then I at least have enough money to keep myself afloat. So from that moment onward, honestly, God, I, I went on a, a, an adventure that hasn't that hasn't stopped since. So for many many years, um, I used to just travel from city to city in the UK. Um, and I used to do gigs. I used to just sell my CDs on the street. Eventually I graduated off the street and I started selling my music in shopping centers. So if you, if you ever go to a shopping mall, you'll see, you have the big stores on the side. And then, you know, in the middle, you have these small kiosks where you have yeah. independent retailers who promote and sell their sure. services. So myself and my friend, um, Shouto, who's also an independent musician, we started doing pop-up shops. So we were the first independent British artists to open our own pop-up shops in shopping centers around the country. So instead of being outside, getting rained on all day long, we moved it indoors. So we'd be there all day long in different cities, talking to people, promoting our, selling our CDs, selling our t-shirts, hoodies, caps, just all of our different merchandise. And we would normally do that for 10 to 10, 10 days to two weeks per month. And that became enough for us to sustain ourselves. So we did that. That was our main bread and butter from about 2015 until 2019. So every month we were just doing, you know, we did dozens and dozens of these stores. And anyone who knew me prior to about 2019, if they knew me, they probably knew me from either meeting me out there on the street or bumping into them in a shopping center somewhere, or maybe they'd seen a video on music video on YouTube or something like that. And then coming into late 2018 is when there was a, another big transition. And this is simply where, okay, so I often say that the Western world started to really go crazy around around 2015. And I was starting to notice this myself. Um, I, I'd been listening to, wow, a lot of different people listening to the Joe Rogan podcast. I think perhaps that's around the time I first I first heard about you. I remember discovering Jordan Peterson in 2016. You and him, you both spoke about about the Bill C sixteen in Canada. Uh -huh. I started, yep. I st I started seeing strange things going on, and there's actually something that's a specific catalyst. I don't know if I've told this story before of what the catalyst was that actually caused me to start to speak out more publicly and start to share more of my thoughts, which is what people, funnily enough, now know me for rather than simply my music. And I remember there was um. I won't say his name, but there was somebody I know, somebody I know had met personally, who was the student union president at a university in the UK. Uh, so someone who's got, you know, he's, he's a young guy, but he's in a position of power. And he's very, in modern day terminology, very woke. Back at the time, we probably would have called him a social justice warrior. SJW has, is not as popular now as it used to be. <laughs> 
And, uh, you know, we followed each other on Facebook. I'd always see his silly virtue signaling posts and whatever. And I just ignore it, right? Whatever, you know, everyone's entitled to their ideas. But then he posted something one day, which caught my attention. And it was in relation to the university's debate society. And it basically boiled down to, I support free speech, but that doesn't mean we should allow hate speech. And I was like, hmm. I was like, what do you, I, and I, I, I responded. I remember I responded to the message and I said, what exactly do you mean by hate speech? What does, who decides what that is? And he responded something along the lines. Keep in mind, this is after him saying he supports free speech. And this is in relation to the university's debate society. And he said something about um, people should be allowed to speak openly, but they shouldn't be allowed to say things that are hurtful or offensive to other people. And I said, Okay. And, and okay. And anyway, we, we started having a back and forth on Facebook and we, we both had quite significant following. So it was like quite a public conversation. Several thousand people are able to see this conversation. Anyway, after a lot of back and forth, and I've been very reasonable, he says, and, and I, I haven't even put forth any of my particular ideas, by the way, but he ended up saying publicly, and I, I quote, I think I'm pretty much quoting this exactly. People like Zuby are dangerous and have ideas that could get people killed. I don't think people like him should be allowed on university campuses. Yikes. So this is, yes. So this is after I've seen, um, you know, Ben Shapiro being protested in Berkeley over in California, Milo Yiannopoulos, people setting fire to places and causing hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage, all the Bill C-16 stuff going on in Canada, the transgender craziness slipping into certain... All right, I, I'd been observing all of this stuff for a while. And when this, when this guy said that, that was when I was like, okay, this is real. This isn't just stuff I see on the internet, right? To use your terminology, this is a true idea pathogen that has reached our shores, right? He said that I, I, I'm a pretty moderate person. I'm not some extreme radical, but I thought, oh, wow, a student union president thinks that I, I little old me, should be banned from university campuses. I, so I've gone from graduating 10 years ago to being told that I, I shouldn't even be allowed on a university campus. So I think that triggered something in my brain. And it made me say, this is going too far. I need to speak up about this kind of stuff. And so late 2018, particularly on Twitter, I just started, nothing crazy, I just started sharing more of my thoughts on what was going on in the world. And at the time, I probably would have had about 16 or 17,000 followers on Twitter. And I started noticing that some of the things I was saying were really resonating and particularly resonating in the USA. I, I was starting to get re retweeted into all these different spheres and people started to be like, hey, like this guy is talking sense. I remember as well at the time, one of the first tweets I ever had go viral before the deadlift one, which I'm sure we'll come to. Yeah. Um, do, do, you re do you remember in, um, it was the same year, it was 2018. Do you remember when Kanye West came out wearing the mega hat? Yes. You remember that? And do you remember how the media responded and treated him? Yeah. So in a sense, I, actually, I was going to, you preempted one of my questions, which is, are you are you trying to go down the trajectory of, well, here is a black man who's not behaving in the way we expect him to behave. And I was because yes. I was going to ask you it. And forgive me if this is inappropriate, but I don't think so. Uh, you know, do you think that part of the push that made you go more viral is precisely because you are not the black exemplar of the positions that you should be taking? Um, I think I think it's probably a factor. Um, I think a lot of things sort of factor into my being and my personality and characteristics that have made it sort of resonate with more people. Um, but yeah, I, I was, look, I, I believe that people, obviously, people should be allowed to have their thoughts. If you have a democratic society, regardless of your skin color, gender, whatever, you should be allowed to vote for and support the person you want. So what I saw when Kanye was wearing the mega hat wasn't even him saying, hey, everybody, you need to go and vote for Trump or vote Republican. He himself didn't even vote for Trump. He was just saying, I'm a free man. I'm allowed to wear this hat. If you can wear, um, you know, if you can wear an Obama t-shirt, why can't I wear a Trump hat? And the media was, wow. 
I mean, yeah. I remember, do you remember, I, which, would you remember one of the pundits said that this is what happens when Negroes don't read? Do you remember that statement? <laughs> I, I think so. Who, who was that? I think on, 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 wow. I don't, I, you know, I don't want to say the wrong name. Okay, I think yeah, I know yeah, who yeah. it was. We'll, we'll look I, it up. I think yeah. I know who it was, but um, it was, I think it was on CNN. It was on a main, and I was just watching this, like, this is crazy. I can't believe this, yeah. this response, just the way that the, you know, it was, it was very concerning. So one of the first ever tweets I had that went viral in, in the USA was simply saying, um, I think I actually remember exact, the exact tweet. I think I just said, LOL at all these people calling Kanye West lost. Maybe he's not the lost one. That's right. all I said. And it went, it went viral. It was very polarizing. Some people started attacking me. This this was this was like my first time really getting attacked, on, really getting attacked on Twitter. And then other people were supporting me. And and then we fast forward a few months. Um, and of course, February 26, 2019. I you have become my world famous, champion. Yes, I have my famous deadlift tweet where I identify as a woman. I post a nine second clip of me lifting 230 kilos and saying that um I've broken the British women's deadlift record. I remember very specifically when I posted that I had 19,000 followers. And here's another funny thing about that. When I posted that, I was actually at my pop-up shop. So I was still selling my CDs and promoting my music out there, wondering what my next move was. And I had just seen multiple stories of males identifying as women and breaking women's records and things. You know, I was just seeing crazy things happening, mostly in the USA and Canada. So I just posted that tweet thinking that, it's going to get a few laughs. Um, a lot of people ask me if I if I marketed it or if I had some plan. I didn't have any plan. I just thought, I think this is funny. It's making an important point. Other people might think it's funny. Lo and behold, this is the thing that just, of all the things up. that I put out, <laughs> yep, of all the things I've put out into the world over the past decade plus, that was the thing that just captured the public imagination that's how everyone from Joe Rogan to Tucker Carlson to Piers Morgan to Ben Shapiro, Candace, that's how all these people discovered me. So within a few months, I find myself on the Joe Rogan experience. I find myself sitting down with Tucker Carlson. I find myself touring the USA and doing all these interviews and podcasts with different people. And I guess from that moment onward, it introduced my personality and my ideas and my story and everything else into the public sphere. So now that we're almost five years past that now, um, I've been able to maintain that trajectory and momentum. I managed to turn something that honestly could have just been a little flash in the pan, you know, a little two, two week viral moment. Um, I managed to use that to draw attention to all the things that I really do and the things that I really care about and the message that I'm really trying to put out there. So, um, that's an overview of no, that's the last a beautiful few decades. Now, so you're whatever point you're at now, are you still given that it probably isn't incorrect, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. You're now much more known for your thoughts than for your music. Uh, is that something that upsets you because you'd love to be as known for your music as your thoughts uh, in a, in a dream world? you would be, you know, the world famous rapper and who cares about your thoughts or let's have both of them or have you transitioned? And while you may still be interested in music, this is no longer your main interest. Whereas now you're, you're a man of ideas. That's a great question, Gad. Um, there's many ways to answer it. Firstly, I'd say that I've always been a man of ideas. Um, I just thought that the only way that I should put them out there was through my music. So I think really what happened is that I I unshackled myself, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Right? So, yeah, so I, I still make music. Um, I've put out several releases since this has happened. And I was initially frustrated that I was getting all of this attention for a silly tweet, whereas I have all these other things that I've really put my time, my energy, my creativity into, which got some attention, but not the same level. And then I changed my mindset around that. I thought, okay, music is, let's say I have a house. I always use this metaphor. I have a house and I want people to come through the front door and the front door is my music. And then I changed my mind to, look, I don't care if people come through the front door, the side door, the back door, whatever. It's a buffet. I'll, I'll put out different things and people can come and pick what they like. If somebody likes my music, that's cool. If somebody likes my podcast, fantastic. 
They like my fitness book. Cool. They want to come to a live event. They just like my tweets or they like my Instagram reels or my YouTube videos, whatever it is. If I can offer some type of inspiration and motivation and ability to nudge people in a positive direction, I don't care whether it's a book, it's this conversation, it's seeing me chatting on TV with Piers Morgan. I don't care what the format is. I'm ultimately a communicator. Um, I can communicate in different mediums. I'm thankful that I, I have a gift for that. So <laughs> there's going to be more of everything. There's going to be more books. There's going to be more music, more podcasts. I'm just I'm just going to do it all. And I let the chips fall where they may. As long as people like what I'm doing and it's resonating with them, then as far as I'm concerned, it's still aligned with my original music mission. It just means that I'm doing it in some additional ways now. So I'm happy with it. I would use another C word instead of communicator. You're a creator. And the reason why I'm saying that is because in in the in my happiness book, you actually touch on several points. I mean, your your career trajectory, in a sense, proves that you don't necessarily need to re be reading my book because you're already, you know, uh, implementing many of the things that I, uh, you know, uh, prescribe to people. Number one, I argue that all other things equal when you're trying to pick the, you know, the the best possible profession for you. Immerse yourself within your creative impulse. And then I use example, and I think we might have discussed this the last time I appeared on your show, uh, if memory serves me right. You could be a chef, you could be an architect, you could be a podcaster, you could be a musician, you could be a stand-up comic, you could be an author, you could be a professor. These are very, very different mediums and very, very different domains. But what all of these folks share in common is they create something from nothing, the new, the new dish, the new bridge, the new stand-up routine, and so on. And so that's what you do, right? You're creating content in your... Uh, podcast. You're creating new music that didn't exist until you came along. You're creating new ideas, new tweets, new humorous moments, whatever it is. And I think there is no more direct way to uh, instantiate your sense of purpose and meaning than to create. The second thing I would say, which I've always found from when I first started following you, is you're very comfortable in engaging in marketing of yourself now oftentimes people view that as you know it's gauche it's it's uh you know i, I get a lot of my colleagues who apologize 34 you know lines before they say uh oh well, you know here's my latest paper well well, well there's nothing i mean the there's certainly, I mean, it could be obnoxious if you're promoting yourself in a context where you shouldn't be, but you know, I'm housed in a business school. I teach consumer psychology. I'm a professor of marketing. What product is there that's more important than yourself? So marketing yourself is a fundamental feature of you know the most important product that one can ever market. And so you're very good at it. Is this something that you think you were born with? I mean, you just have that innate talent to hustle, to be persistent, to be resilient, to promote and so on. Mm -hmm. Or is this something that you learned? Is it something you 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 read a, a couple of books that says, here are the three steps for marketing yourself? Well, what was that trajectory like? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is why I think it's important to tell my whole story because I have sold over 30,000 CDs hand to hand. Wow. 30,000. Do you know how many people you have to talk to face to face to sell 30,000 albums? I have spoken to over half a million people. Right. I sold my CDs on the street for over a decade. That was my full-time job, just going out there and talking to thousands of people a week and promoting my music to them. So over the course of that time, wow, you learn a lot of things. You learn a lot about human psychology. You learn a lot about sales. You learn a lot about marketing, communication. Yes. You learn a lot about resilience, grit, handling rejection. I was just, One of the let questions... me stop you right there. <laughs> Forgive me because, okay. be, be, because I was going to come to rejection. So, you know, it seems it, for me when I when I see salespeople, now you could argue I'm a salesman of ideas, right? I'm I'm proposing my ideas to the world, and hopefully people quote buy them, people consume them. But I'm not doing face to face, right? Intercepting people in the street, where the the rate of rejection is going to be astounding. And based on the personality that I know you you have, you're you're probably someone who took it well and kept smiling. What's the secret to that? Because very few people can handle a rejection rate of 95%, if not higher, and keep slugging along. How did you do that? And yeah. then you can go on with your story. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad you asked about this because it's actually a very fundamental part of my story 
which I think a lot of people are not aware of. I think because so many people now discover me online, they sort of missed that whole period from 2006 to 2019, where I was just grinding, like really grinding. And when I say that, I don't mean sending emails. I mean, out there. I mean, I didn't just sell my CDs in the UK. I sold my CDs in Budapest. I sold my CDs in Prague. I sold my CDs in Berlin. I was traveling. I was all over the place. I was a true road warrior. Um, I still am a road warrior, but I now do it on a on a bit of a, in, a, in a different level. Um, so actually, I can probably give you some numbers. I can say that when I was selling on the street, I'd probably say that about maybe about 30% of people would stop. So just stop 30, to engage you. Yes, I'd say about I'd stop about 30% of people. Um, it could it could vary on a very good day. It might go as high as 50% of people might stop. And then I'd say of all the people I stopped, if I stopped someone, there was probably about a one in three chance they would buy an album. Okay. So I had a pretty I, I, so I had a pretty good percent chance rate. of of people buying your your that that's higher exactly. than I thought. I would have thought that yeah. it would be well below five percent. Yeah, no, I'd say it was about 10% in total. So if I wanted to sell 30 CDs in a day, I, I could pretty much wager that if I spoke to, you know, 300 ish people, um, I attempted to speak to 300 people, I, I, I'd get 30 CDs sold. Um, and, and a lot of this, by the way, is a lot of it is, is it's personality driven. It's about your approach. Um, there's very different ways that you can approach people. There's ways you can approach people where, yeah, you're going to get a 95% rejection rate. But, um, you know, I'm an, I'm an amiable guy. I know how to communicate and put my body language in a way to put people at ease. Um, I don't, I, I would never approach someone aggressively or directly asking for a sale or it would just be, you know, a very, very friendly, amiable thing. Find out if they have time even to begin with. Right. Excuse me, sir. Do you have a moment to, do you have a moment? Um, I just, do you have a moment or, you know, actually what kind of, what, what kind of music do you listen to? A lot of right. people will stop for that question. What sort of music do you listen to? And then I can introduce them, tell them who I am, tell them what I'm doing. I can show them the music and I would let people listen. I wasn't, I would never try to sell my music without allowing them to listen to it. I say, if you've got a minute, I can play you a little bit of the music. If you like what you hear and you'd like to support, Here's how much it costs. Put the CD in their hand. My CDs are professionally made. It's not a it's not a CDR with some scribble on it. It look it's a looks you know it's a properly made album. And so someone would listen. I'd play them a few different tracks, and if they liked it, and they had a little bit of money on them, there's a at that point you know you've got a you've got a pretty high chance that the person is going to buy it. And you learn to interact with different people: young, old, men, women, groups versus individuals couples. I, I, man, I had some funny moments out there on the street. I had some times where, um, and by the way, this is also wh why I, um, you know, I got my French and Spanish up to conversational level because I was selling my CDs in the UK and there were so many tourists coming from different countries and certain cities. And I found, you know, this was just problem solving. I, I try to stop people and they look at me weird. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay. I think, I think they're French. And so I'm like, all right. I need to brush up on my French. And so next thing, you know, uh, you know, I, excuse me, guys, what kind of music do you listen to? You know, to give me a blank stare. Uh, Excusez-moi, uh, quel type de musique uh, vous écoutez-vous? Right? And then, um, oh, bonjour, je m'appelle Zubi, uh, je suis un rappeur indépendant. Je suis ici aujourd'hui pour promouvoir ma musique. Look uh, at you breaking out the French. Est-ce est que vous aimez uh, hip-hop? Uh, tu aimes hip-hop? Right? And, and, you know, and, and, and at that point, you know, imagine a group of French teenagers and they've just met a rapper in the street in the UK. He's now speaking to them in French and they're like, this is the coolest guy in the world. Right? Mm -hmm. Boom. Get 50, 10 CDs sold. 10. Boom. Wow. 10 gone. Right? Like, so that's how <laughs> I had some real adventures out there. There are, there are days actually... I, in some ways, I don't miss it, but in other ways, I actually sort of miss just going out there every day, being an adventure, connecting with all these different people face to face. So I learned a, I learned a lot from that. And I think that a lot of what I'm now able to bring into the online world and the podcasting world and the public speaking and all that, honestly, the seeds for all of that was planted in those days when I was just out there talking to people nonstop, um, promoting myself, selling myself. And I also have a different view on it. It's funny because my whole career, I was critic. The thing I got the most criticism for 
was self-promoting too much. Mm. Right. I remember there'd be people who to this day, there's people who complain that I wear my own hats or I wear my own t-shirts with my, with my logo on it or whatever. And the way I always viewed it was number one, I'm an independent musician. I don't have a record label. I don't have a manager. I don't have big PR budgets and all this stuff. If I don't promote myself, nobody is going to do it for me. If I don't promote myself, I can't make money. I can't earn a living. No one is going to hear about my stuff, let alone buy it. And then I also flip, I also flip sales on its head a little bit. And I have a belief that if you have, if you have a product or a service that can genuinely help people and make their lives better, and you believe in that, I don't just think that you should sell it. I think you have an ethical duty to sell it. I think if you have a book about happiness, if you've spent time researching and writing a book about happiness that can genuinely make, potentially make millions or even billions of people's lives better, I think you have an ethical duty to promote and to sell it, right? If you hide it away, if you're a fantastic musician and you make all of this music and you record it, and then you just hide it, you just hide it away in your cabinet, I, I think you're doing something that's unethical, right? I think you should go out there and you should share your gifts with the world. If Lionel Messi, I know you're a big fan of him, if he was if he was content to just be the best football player in his little neighborhood league or school, yeah, yeah, and in, in, in his neighborhood, and he never aspired to any more, and he he never wanted to share his gift with the world, then I think actually you're 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 now withholding something that other people could benefit from. So when I think of sales, I mean, if, if someone is trying to push something that's harmful, you know, like genuinely bad for people, that's different. Or trying to scam people, that's different. But I think if you have something that's good and that it that it helps people, it brings joy into their life, it helps them reframe their mind in a better way, it helps them get in better physical shape, whatever it might be, it helps them save money. I think that there's a duty to promote it. So I don't think that there's anything dirty about sales or marketing or promotion or anything like that. I think that salespeople are fantastic. I think that we're we are actually all salespeople, whether you consider yourself one or not. We're always selling each ideas all day, every day. So I think it's best to do it with some intention and do it consciously. And um, yeah, I totally reject the idea that there's something wrong with selling. Um, I think that selling is a very good thing as long as what you're selling, like I said, is is helpful and beneficial to people. Yeah, so I wrote an article, I can't remember how many years ago, maybe five, six, seven years ago. At the time, I had a very active Psychology Today column. Uh, I think I published over 300 articles on that site from 2008 till about two years ago. And so I was very, very productive in that within that medium. And one of the articles that I had written, which I was thinking about eventually turning into a book, I think the title of the article is uh, Marketing is Life and Life is Marketing where basically I was arguing and what, I mean, the whole point of the book would be to demonstrate the importance of marketing across a bewildered, because we, we typically think of marketing of, you know, marketing of Gillette and marketing of Starbucks, but you know, you engage in marketing in the mating market, you engage in marketing in the labor market, you engage in marketing when you're pitching your ideas. You So, you know, animals engage in marketing when they engage in sexual signaling as per Darwin's theory of sexual selection. So everything is marketing. So oftentimes I get some troll on, uh, on, on, uh, you know, on social media saying, yeah, right, you, you know, you teach marketing, or whatever. First of all, you know, marketing, I mean, as I use it, as you know, you know, I apply biology and psychology to study consumer and economic decision making. You know, it, it's hardly a lot. I mean, the entire world operates on capitalism. All of the the apps that we now have are based on an understanding of marketing and the most fundamental drivers of human nature. So it always bewilders me when people, because marketing is a term that can be either used colloquially right i'm 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 printing flyers from my for my local block party and i'm going to market it and then they think that when marketing as a scientific discipline well it must be the same kind of be whereas you know if you just look at the salaries of professors the the ones who are in the business schools get paid the highest bucks precisely because they have very relevant and marketable skills right so if you're a, a economist who studies you know, 
you know, uh, something in marketing, or you're an anthropologist who applies their craft in marketing, or you're, in my case, a psychologist who studies consumer behavior, it's hardly something to laugh at. So I love the fact that, you know, without you having had the training in business school, you're a natural born marketer, you understand the dynamics, and you even said it, right? I mean, hey, I learned French, because now I could reach this particular segment. Well, you just, you just, got an A on the marketing 101 exam where we talk about segmenting and targeting, right? You you segmented the market and then you thought, well, what is the optimal persuasion strategy that I can reach that target market? And in this case, simply saying a few words in their language increases your, well, you just passed business school, right? So yeah. it's it's all good, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, and the thing is as well, I think something that's been really core for me and of course, this is related to your book, which I have read, by the way. I, <coughs> I know you said I don't, I, I don't, I don't need to, but I did anyway. You know, you're very kind. New, new, new book by the Godfather. Of course, I'm going to buy it. Got to support. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, I think the thing that sometimes people forget, and I think this is also the reason why many people give up, is to both trust and enjoy the process. Right. Um, I remember when I was in my 20s, and I'd been struggling with my music for a while, trying to make it as an independent artist and keep myself afloat and all that. Um, and one of the things that kept me going wasn't just belief and knowing that, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to break through on this thing somehow. It was also just genuinely enjoying the process. You know, we all have times where we want to, you, you kind of wish you could fast forward. You wish you could leapfrog it. You wish you could uh, you know, fast forward. I know you lost a lot of weight recently. You wish you could fast forward the gym sessions and fast forward the cardio and just press, press some button and you've just done it right. You're trying to learn a language or learn an instrument, any new skill. And you wish you could just download it to your brain. And I don't think that people should really wish for that. I think people should really enjoy, enjoy the process and honestly have fun with it treat treat it like an adventure um i very much live my life like almost like it's a video game and i'm a character in it and i'm just sort of going to different locations and meeting different people and taking on different quests and new challenges and solving new problems and puzzles that that's very much how i view it and i think that if you if you take life on that way and you recognize yeah it's going to have there's going to be moments where it, where it sucks you're going to you're going to be happy you're going to be sad you're going to have your ups, you're going to have your downs, but in the grand scheme of things, it's also very fun. It's also very fun. And I think if someone perhaps is not enjoying their life, then man, I, I, I think they just need to sort of reframe, reframe their thinking and find that sort of childish joy in the little everyday things again. I think that as adults, especially once you have a routine, you can you you can just feel like you're just repeating things and you don't even know why you're doing it. You're not having fun interactions. And in, in every day, no matter what city or whatever country I'm in, I, you know, I'll, I'll have random conversations with strangers. I'll ha exchange pleasantries with the person at the checkout. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be in the gym and I'll just, I don't know, just in, engage with someone or just do little things to, to just enjoy, enjoy things that could otherwise be very mundane. Right. When I was out there on the street or in shopping malls, standing around all day long, right? I'd be standing there for hours and hours and hours. And um, I'd give myself little challenges. You were you were talking before about rejection. <laughs> Here, here's something I would actually do. When I was having a day where um I was either just getting very tired or I felt like quitting, do you know what I would do? Is I would say, I'm gonna go get 10 rejections in a row. If I get 10 rejections in a row, I'll go home. Right. I'd normally end up staying out for another two hours. Right. right. I talked to seven people, seven rejections, and then, ah, that next person stops and they buy something. And that gives me that little bit of motivation to go again. So I'm actually going to people and I'm going in the mindset of, okay, I'm ready for the rejection. Right. I, I want you to reject me so that I can go home. And it, it just, I, I don't know. I just play these little games. I, if I were out selling with one of my friends, we'd, um, we'd sometimes see who could get, who could get the craziest sale of the day. Right. So maybe this might mean approaching someone who's like 75 years old and selling them a hip hop album. Or maybe this means like um, I remember once, you know, just someone was stopped at a, at a red light in the car and I went and 
I, you know, I got, I, he was listening to hip hop. I heard he was listening to hip hop in his car. And I went to him while he was at the light and I did a quick pitch and he bought my CD out the car window. Right. And I go back to my friend. I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> and so, you know, you, you gamify it, right. You, you, you make things fun. And, um, I'd like to think, I'd, I'd like to hope that I can maintain that throughout my life. Um, as I go into, you know, new phases over the next decades, getting married, Lord willing, becoming a father, all of that stuff. I'd like to never lose that, lose that sense of play and that sense of life is, life is fun and it's to be enjoyed. Well, you, you, you've clearly read my book because of course I've got a whole chapter on life as a playground and boy, do you exude that spirit. Uh, you are a joy to chat with. You are a your endless positivity. I think that's probably of all the many reasons why people uh, resonate with your message. I think it's that it's, it's you, you know, you're amiable, you're affable. You're just a great guy. And I can't wait to meet you in person. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Zuby. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Stay on the line so we could say goodbye offline. Cheers.